Imagine you are in your room doing some work. Suddenly you hear this sound. What, what would you do? Exactly, you would open the door. And that's what I did too. Open the door, but no one was out there. Heard the sound again, open the door, but no one was out there. It took me a while to realize that the sound actually came from my computer. Back in early 2000, Yahoo Messenger played this alert when a contact came online. I was around the age of some of you guys, and I had opened my door for that tone. It may appear stupid now, but it made perfect sense to me back then, because I had not used a computer before. So my natural and instinct response to a door knocking sound was to simply open the door. That's how I understood that sound. Now this is just one example, but in general, it was very hard for me to work with the computers. The keyboard layout, keyboard shortcuts, mouse interactions, all these were totally alien. I felt really disabled by the technology, having to learn a whole new set of skills to be able to use a computer. I remember my very first practical exam in the university, where we had to write a computer program in a given time. I wrote down the algorithm on paper pretty quickly, but it took such a long time to type it out, finding keys one at a time, time ran out, system shut down, and I failed. So my own disability of dealing with computers made me realize that there's a huge potential to make a significant impact if you were to create intuitive, enabling human computer interfaces. Computers have become an integral part of our lives, right? I mean, not just this keyboard and box version, but all these other smart devices that pretty much has a computer. Why can't we make the interaction with them very intuitive, as intuitive as knocking on the door? To explore this, we coined the term assistive augmentations. The idea of creating, enabling, intuitive human computer interfaces. Suppose you want to copy paste something within your computer application. You can do control C, control V, right click, copy, right click, paste. Is that intuitive? It took me a while to learn those things because those things are not built into us. Even if you knew them, how about copying pasting between devices? say from your smartphone to your tablet computer. There are cloud-based services, but I believe we should be able to do much, much better. The inspiration came from my own cultural background, where we do this traditional activity called tilaka. Basically, it's a process of creating a colored mark. I have colored powder here. I take it with my fingertip and then move to my forehead. So that's a process of moving physical matter from one place to another in a very seamless way. Can we move digital data just like that? That's what one of our projects, Project Sparsh, does. Moving physical digital data between devices as if they are physical. I'm going to try doing a live demo of that technology. So I have Sparsh running on this smartphone. And I have Sparsh running on this computer. So what I'm going to do is try and move some data from here to there. And I'm going to generate some content live to make it more exciting. So let me do a selfie right now. <laughs> so this is my souvenir for the day. So I capture that image. I have it in my gallery. So I go to the gallery, grab that image, similar to the way I grab that color powder. So now it's conceptually in my hand. Now I'm moving to my desktop and pasting it similar to I pasted on my forehead. That's the image. Thank you. Thank you. So the data actually transferred through the cloud, but the point is I interacted in a very natural and intuitive way. There are other sparse interactions, as you can see from this video. I see a phone number on my web browser. I just grab it and drop it to my phone. Now I can call that number. I have a movie in my phone. I take it and I pass it to my friend's phone. You don't even need to have your phone with you. Just grab whatever you want to copy, go home, 
and tap the device that you want the data to be pasted as if you would carry physical matter with you. Now, this is a very good example of what I call assistive augmentation. Technology that's seamlessly integrated with our natural behavior and enabling us to do things beyond what we think we could do. They may appear simple, but they are very powerful. If we had technologies like SPARS 16 years ago, I wouldn't have been felt disabled by technology. And sometimes we think technology has a condition in our body. Well, that's not always the case. At MIT, I had a colleague, Sunish. He was blind. But he was just like one of us. He had his own ways to get his stuff done. I have seen him using a smartphone, which took him a little bit of time because he needed to find the phone, unlock the screen, browse to app using voiceover feature, which means whatever he touches gets spoken back to him. Use that to go to an app, open the app. Even then, taking a good picture was a difficult task. This was not because Sunish didn't know how to use a smartphone. This was more of a case of this state-of-the-art technology making him do a lot of extra work before he gets something done. The technology made him disabled, just like how it made me disabled. So that motivated us to come up with another assistive augmentation, the finger reader. A finger-worn assistive device that basically helps you to point at something and hear more information. I have the latest version of the finger read in my hand. I'm going to explain this with a, with a live demo. So allow me to connect this guy here. So I'm connecting the finger reader to my phone. It automatically recognizes. Finger reader detached. See you soon. Hi, Suranga. Finger reader is at your service. So now I have this nice looking Chinese menu. And I'm going to see what oh, I'm trying this. Sichuan chili chicken. Fried chicken with ginger and red chilies. Sounds, sounds tasty. If I gave my name card to a blind person, the person can use the finger reader to read my name, hopefully. Suranga Nanayakara, Augmented Human Lab. So, finger that's what finger reader detached. is. See you soon. Basically, it has a micro camera, computer vision algorithm, speech input output that allows me to simply point at something, camera sees it, recognizes, and have the spoken, the results spoken back to me. And with finger reader, Sunish could walk into a store, shop on his own. You point at currency notes, it tells him the value of the notes. You can point at a price tag. The finger reader will tell him the price of that item. Or Sunish could walk into a library, pick a book from a library bookshelf, which is almost impossible with any of the available technologies. Once you grab that book, you can flip through pages and read line by line. The finger reader reads the text in front of your fingertip and provides feedback to stay on the line. Now, this is very powerful. It completely removed the overhead associated with having to use a smartphone app. It is based on our natural behavior of pointing and asking questions. And thirdly, even if you are blind, you can frame a good image by using your fingertip as the reference point. The use cases are not limited to blind people because it is an assistive augmentation that is very intuitive to use. So this could be a tool for creativity, capturing beautiful textures, colors from nature, and bring them as digital paint into your digital devices. Or it could be a tool to support learning. It reads things back to you. This is my daughter trying to read a book. So it reads a bat as he pointed at the, the word. Or it could be a tool for travelers. I wish I had this when I was in Japan. You can point at products, point of interest, and it can translate the, the information back to your own language. The possibilities are unlimited. And I'm very, very proud to announce that the Finger Reader team has made it ready for mass production. And one of the guys who made it happen is right there. <laughs> so we are actually going to open this technology to the entire developer community, because I believe someone out there will come up with use cases 
that we have never thought of. If you take a step back, there are so many technologies that keeps coming into our lives, of course hoping to make our lives better. But I think we need to ask the question, are they really making our lives better? Or are they really making us feel disabled if we do not know how to use them? Now don't get me wrong, there are so many needs and conditions that the technology can certainly support. But sometimes we only focus on the technology, optimizing it, making it faster, making it more energy efficient, making it precise, etc. My point is, technologies without intuitive interfaces will make us feel disabled, will leave some of us behind. We don't want that to happen, do we? So encapsulate the technology so that it operates implicitly in the background while enhancing the human experience in the foreground. Let us not make ourselves feel disabled by the technology. Let us feel the technology. Let's embed the idea of assistive augmentation, making things intuitive and enabling as we develop the next generation of technologies, devices, processes, systems, policies, so on and so forth. Because that will help us stay human, enhancing the way we work, live and play, and finding the humanity in technology. Thank you.